Kochnava na ukran, Samarkand azam, Registan kashida, Aileymiz tazam, Bunda babalarını nigahı yaşar, Bunda ajdad bile avlad uçraşar, Koyıldı samanin taqiga narvan Cahanlı boylaşka bızdı kop imkan Harpi ruvaliden soraymız dua Şu azat vatenge bolsun can fida Uzbekistan, and particularly Samarkand, a place in the world that everyone should visit at least once. The most populous country in Central Asia and the center and source of civilization and culture for the whole region for thousands of years, until the Russian problem showed up, Uzbekistan is a country trying to get back to that status. There's definitely arguments for it. In addition to being the most populous country in the region, Uzbekistan is also the largest producer of electricity in the region, it has huge natural gas reserves, it is a major producer of cotton, a well-educated workforce, a history of civilization that is only dwarfed by China in the region, a healthy and rising total fertility rate, also the only one in the region, and rapidly recovering economically after nearly 100 years of dictatorship. It has a monumentally complicated road ahead of it, and in the following three episodes, I will try to tell a short version of the story of Uzbekistan. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth featured installment of the Central Asia series. Alright, so this is the Uzbek Republic or Uzbekistan Republika Si. Like many other places in the world, Uzbekistan is also uh, well comprised of three countries. So there is the Far West, which is the uh, place where the Karakalpak people lives. Uh, you might have seen it in uh, recent months in the news as the Karakalpakstan protests. Most of those occurred here in the town called Nukus. So the far west is Karakalpakstan. Then there's most of the center which is indeed uh, Uzbekistan where the Uzbek people lives. Then there's the capital city Toshkent, or Tashkent in English and Russian, um, which is in fact located on the far eastern part of the country, where indeed <clears throat> things are a bit more complicated, depends on who you ask, and uh, if you ask the right people they will say, well, in the far east uh, there is the, uh, they call it Turkestan. So, there is that. In the past there used to also be um, a terrorist movement that uh, was uh, on a US sanction list called the Free Turkistan <coughs> Movement. So there is that. <coughs> to put the country in on the global map, its neighbors, uh, so to the um, north and uh, west, there's Kazakhstan, so just um, above uh, Uzbekistan uh, resides Kazakhstan. Um, Shemkent, the town that I discussed uh, briefly with you in uh, the third episode of this series is somewhere around here, just uh, behind uh, this up close of uh, Toshkent. And um, then to the south there is Turkmenistan, uh, most of the south uh, west of the country uh, is uh, borders Turkmenistan, again the uh, only autocracy in the world that is legitimately comparable to um, DPRK. Then uh, to the deep south for a short sliver of land, uh, Uzbekistan borders Afghanistan, 
uh, so you know this particular border crossing with Afghanistan is um, allegedly uh, one of the most militarized ones in the world of course barring the DMZ uh, between DPRK and the Republic of Korea and then uh, uh, to the uh, southeast uh, is uh, Kyrgyzstan here and Tajikistan here so um, this is a very complicated area uh, and then there's these uh, please pay attention to these uh, as you can see there's a separation between the rest of Uzbekistan and these uh, villages these portions these small portions these are called the Uzbek exclaves on the Kyrgyz territory and these are one uh, are some of the uh, areas in Central Asia that unfortunately up until this day uh, they are seeing uh, well, border conflicts. Uzbekistan unfortunately is one of those countries just like Kyrgyzstan and just like Tajikistan and just like uh, even Turkmenistan uh, that has not settled its borders and this uh, part of the eastern border of uh, Uzbekistan is the portion of the country where uh, there are still border disputes and these exclaves are um, one of the sources of the disputes. These exclaves come from the former Soviet Union when uh, uh, Moscow was more than happy to uh, give in to various, uh, some of them invented, some of them genuine, but nevertheless demands uh, of uh, locals to be included into one Soviet Socialist Republic over another. And of course, uh, at that time, very few protested against the move uh, because one, well, it was all the same country, but when the USSR uh, disintegrated, it left the newly independent nations with these kinds of essentially clusterfucks. All right, so with the geography out of the way, in this video we'll go through the history of Uzbekistan. And by that I mean we'll attempt and fail to scratch the surface of the history of Uzbekistan. And at the end of the episode you may know why Uzbekistan is worth visiting and maybe researched a lot more. After two weeks here and going through its major historical provinces, except Karakalpakstan, which was closed, I know I need to come back to this country again sometime this decade, not only because of its rich history, but also because of its highly complex present and its recent history being shrouded in mystery. But first things first, like everywhere else in Central Asia, the settled and recorded history starts with the Scythians. If you remember in the third episode of the series I mentioned the part where Alexander the Great fought a battle here in the 4th century BC and the river where that battle took place serves to this day as the border between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Now, that's not to say the history of this part of the world starts in the 4th century BC, but it is to say that prior to that we can only make suppositions. But even suppositions are complicated to make and there is no guideline on that because unlike Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan is in the process of writing its own story. But more on that later. What's a lot more important to know is that the region that is now more or less Uzbekistan is accustomed, historically speaking, with religious, cultural and ethnic diversity in a way that is not related necessarily to warfare or repression, as it is the case with neighboring Kazakhstan. So what you're looking at right now is footage from the historical part of the city Samarkand, today only the second biggest city in the country because the USSR moved the capital to Tashkent, but for over 2000 years prior to that, the center of culture and civilization for the whole region. Now, of course, everyone who goes to Samarkand will show you a lot of these very nice old-looking buildings, but Samarkand is an attraction for its political importance as well, but also because a lot of its old part still really looks like this. Some of these streets appear on maps from the 7th century. Of course, the houses are not that old and the road has been updated, but you will notice no sewage system, and that's because there is none. More or less, these dwellings have remained in the same format for over 1500 years. 
Of course, modern technology has been adopted. There is no heavy smell or any relevant risk of diseases. In fact, if you look close to the houses themselves, this is where rich people live. But the fact that the format was kept almost intact is what makes some of these streets an attraction in and of themselves. The city appears as a city and a trade center in chronicles dating back from the times of Alexander the Great, and those assume that the city was, at that time, at least 400 years old. So, suffice to say that Samarkand is old, really old, about the same age as Rome itself, if not slightly older. It was a trade center and a source of culture and civilization before Alexander the Great conquered it. The war damaged the city quite significantly, but within a decade the city flourished again under Hellenic rule. That's also when Greek aesthetics come into the area and remained even after Alexander's death and the decline of overall Greek influence in the region. For instance, by the 4th century AD, the modern-day territory of Uzbekistan was part of something called the Kushan Empire, which spanned through much of modern-day territory of Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and northern India. The Kushans were an Indo-European dynasty that was indigenous of Central Asia. Nevertheless, they kept the Greek influence and indeed spread it from Samarkand to other areas of the empire too. However, when that political project collapsed, the city went into a dark period and almost got abandoned. But a few scholars and a few stubborn people kept it alive for over a century until another tribe managed to stabilize a state form, the Hephthalites, or the White Huns. It is the legacy of these people that the 19th century Hungarian explorer Vambery Armin was looking for. Maybe one day, when I have the time and I'm in Budapest, I'll take you to the Vambery house so we can look at the story of this place through the eyes of the first European explorer in the region of the modern era. Anyway, after the White Huns, the whole territory of Uzbekistan ends up uh, under something called Göktürk Haganat, or the First Turkic Empire. This opens a very long period uh, for the cities of modern-day Uzbekistan as centers of civilization, culture, and trade. As you all know, the Silk Road goes through the several cities of Uzbekistan, so it is thus no surprise to learn that China had an opinion about this Turkic Empire. So in 630 and 658, the eastern and western Turkic Haganat were conquered by the Tang Dynasty of China. Why? Well, for starters, because they could, and secondly, because of the strategic Silk Road. But until that happened, the now increasingly Turkic population was introduced to Buddhism, which then got turned into one of the first experiments of political religion in the area that actually worked. Of course, Christians had tried it two centuries earlier, but they failed. So how did Buddhism turn into a political project here? Well, there was a man, Taspar Chaghan. There is no surviving statue of him, only of his predecessors, for some reason. But Taspar was the son of Bumin Chaghan and Wei Chiangle, so a Turco-Chinese ruler and the fourth Hagan of the Turkic Haganat. He came up with the idea of combining the Turkic deities with the Buddhist rite, as it was understood in the 6th century AD here. So, the Turkic deities, Tengri, which represented the sky, Umay, the mother goddess, Yersub, the earth and water, and Erklig, the lord of hell, became Buddhist deities, and Tengri, the ruler of the upper world, held a dominant position. The latter is important because the worship of Tengri, with more or less Buddhist rites, survived to this day in Central Asia, although not in Uzbekistan. Tengrism, as it is known today, is still practiced in Kyrgyzstan, Buryatia, Tuva, and other places in Central Asia and the Far East where Turkic peoples still live. That's why I'm looking forward to go to the Buddhist nation of Lao to see how much similarity is there between the pre-Muslim religion of Tengrism and modern-day practice of Buddhism. So... Yeah, send me to Southeast Asia, please. <laughs> now, I'll get back to Tengrism when we get to Kyrgyzstan. 
Of course, this period of political Turco-Buddhist experiment was slowly but surely replaced by a much more determined political project, namely Islam. In all fairness, the local organizations of the 7th century in what is today Uzbekistan had no chance. The Turco-Buddhists themselves were being slowly displaced by the Persian influences even before the Arab Muslims arrived, and the whole region was under pressure again from the Chinese problem. Available sources on the Arab conquest suggest that the Iranian peoples of Central Asia were unable to defend their land against the Arabs precisely because of internal divisions and the lack of strong indigenous leadership. The Arabs, on the other hand, were led by the brilliant general Kataiba i Buslim and were also highly motivated by the desire to spread their new faith. Islam. And because of these factors, the population of what is today Uzbekistan was easily subdued. Kutaybah i Buslim was a commander of the Umayyad Caliphate. You know, that Ummah that appears in almost any discussion about Islamic theology. The new religion brought by the Arabs spread gradually into the region. The native religious identities were further displaced in the ensuing centuries. Nevertheless, the decisive political victory of Islam in Central Asia came only a century later, in 750, when the Arabs decisively defeated the Chinese armies in a battle at the Talas River, which is one of the three steppe rivers that flow west and then northwest, the other two being Ili and Chu. Today, Talas is on the territory of Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, so is Chu, while Ili is shared between the modern People's Republic of China and Kyrgyzstan. And to this day, all three are a matter of dispute, because the more things change, the more they stay the same. Now, the Arab rule didn't last too long, so the region kept a lot of its Iranian characteristics, and what is today Uzbekistan remained an important center of culture and trade for the following centuries after the adoption of the new religion. In fact, what is today Uzbekistan, then Transoxiana, contributed to the end of the Umayyad Caliphate and the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate in what is known in Islamic historiography as the Abbasid Revolution. The Abbasid dynasty descended from Muhammad's uncle, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, and it was the dynasty that founded the city of Baghdad and established the Muslim Caliphate as it was to be known in history for several centuries until the rise of the Ottoman Empire. But that's a story for another day. What is important to know is that what is today Uzbekistan grew even more every time it was conquered. The cities of Samarkand, Hiva, and Bukhoro were already big before Islam had arrived in the region. But after the arrival of Islam, they became bigger, richer, and more influential, dare I say, globally, by the standard of the known world at the time, of course. And this honeymoon lasted for centuries, as these three cities in particular continued to develop a very special blend of Irano-Persian form of Islam, and the intellectual life continued more or less unabated despite some political changes here and there. Some of that survives to this day. For instance, this construction, the Kalyan Minaret, built in 1127, is still around to be admired in the city of Bukhoro which is quite impressive because this is a place with a lot of earthquakes, so the fact that some of these older constructions are still standing tells us something about how serious the people took their job 900 years ago. Here, perhaps I should note that some of these old buildings one can admire in Samarkand and Bukhoro have been through a complicated process of restoration and indeed reconstruction in some cases. So while this 900 years old minaret is for real, many of these buildings, not so much. But that's a story for episode 8, or episode 17, if it doesn't make the cut. Anyway, this honeymoon ended in the early 1200s, when Genghis Khan showed up. The Mongol invasion and subsequent conquering and settlement was a major turning point for the whole region, and particularly for what is today Uzbekistan, since it was then, and continued to be centuries afterwards, the source of civilization and culture. For starters, the Mongol conquest quickened the process of Turkification in some part of the region. 
Although the armies of Genghis Khan were led by Mongols, they were made up mostly of Turkic tribes that had been incorporated into the Mongol armies as the tribes were encountered in the Mongols' southward sweep. Most of these armies of men remained when the new settlement began, and they mixed with the local populations who, for the most part, did not flee. However, reconstruction took almost a century. The invasion inflicted severe damage on both Bukhara and Samarkand and the region of Khorazm, today still in Uzbekistan with the capital in the city of Hiva, which I did not have the time to visit this time around. Khorazm at the time was a very wealthy province and was treated particularly severely by the Mongols during the initial invasion. The irrigation networks in the region suffered extensive damage that was not repaired for several generations. As such, many of the original Iranian-speaking populations were forced to flee southwards in order to avoid persecution. That took a toll since Hiva was the third center of civilization, culture and trade alongside Samarkand and Bukhara. When Genghis Khan died, the empire was divided among his sons and family members, but it still maintained an orderly succession for several generations. What is today Uzbekistan fell into the Chahatai faction of the Mongol Empire, with the exception of Khorazm province, which was under the Golden Horde. See episode 3 for more details on that. There is no consensus to this day whether the Mongol period was one of decay or one of stagnation. It depends which sources from which city you are reading. The sources from Bukhara say that as late as the 1330s, the city was still in disarray, with the mosques, colleges and bazaars in ruin, and that was after the Mongol rule had ended. The sources in Samarkand talk more about stagnation as the new Mongol rulers behaved very similarly to how Russia was going to behave centuries later, by playing up ethnic tensions and intentionally bringing foreigners to rule. The Mongols had brought in Central Asian Muslims to serve as administrators in China proper, and at the same time sent Han and Hitans from China proper to serve as administrators over the Muslim population in Bukhara and administrators of the riches of Samarkand, where they also prohibited local Muslims, but not foreign Muslims, from administering or owning anything. Tensions ran high, and overall the city stagnated. The only consensus is that not many good things happened. And then comes the year 1365, when a revolt against the Shahatai Mongol control occurred right here in Samarkand. The year is properly remembered to this day because it marks the beginning of what is now known in historiography as the Timurid Renaissance. While Europe was grappling with the late Middle Ages here in Samarkand in particular, but the wider region of what is today Uzbekistan as well, important breakthroughs in science, arts, theology and wisdom were happening. For all intents and purposes, for about 150 years or so, between 1370 and about 1520, these lands and this city in particular were the center of human civilization, and I'm not exaggerating at all. So, after the revolt of 1365, all-out war breaks out for about five years, and in 1370, this guy, Timur Gurkhanu, establishes the Timurid Empire, a culturally Persian empire that gobbled up most of modern-day Iran, Iraq, almost all of Central Asia, the South Caucasus, most of contemporary Pakistan, North India, and almost all of modern-day Turkey. Now, keep in mind that this involved a lot of death. Scholars estimated that his campaigns led to the death of 17 million people, which was about 5% of the global population at the time. Or, as The Guardian would put it, he was a great environmentalist. No, seriously, the British newspaper The Guardian actually said that about Genghis Khan, from which Timur claimed ancestry from. <laughs> With that said, Timur placed the capital of his empire here, in Samarkand. And for the next 36 years, from uh, 1370 and until one year after Timur's death, Samarkand was a constant construction site. The population grew to 150,000 people, which made Samarkand bigger than Rome and in top five biggest cities in the world at the time. 
and Timur was aware of the rest of the world too. Rome had just started the first University of Rome, Sapienza, in 1303. In 1386, Timur orders the construction of a bigger and better university. It was all done by 1388, but it would only become better after his death under the rule of his grandson. Some of that frenzy of building stuff can be admired to this day. For instance, this mosque, the Bibi Hanim Mosque, was built between 1399 and 1404. Timur himself, by now age 68, inaugurated it. But perhaps most important, Timur patronized countless of writers, poets, artists, mathematicians, historians, theologians, and a plethora of other men of letters, thanks to whom we now know a lot more details about this region from 1400 onwards than about most countries of Europe, quite frankly. And this program of actively supporting learning and the arts uh, continued decades after Timur's death. Without this program, the very existence of Turkic literature, for instance, might have never happened, or would have happened entirely differently. Long story short, Timur was a complicated leader. He was a genocidal maniac on one hand, though by no means significantly different than his contemporaries, but also one of the biggest, if not the biggest, patron of arts and learning in the first half of the second millennium, superseded only by his grandson. Timur died the way he lived, during yet another adventure. Throughout his rule, he invaded Russia and China multiple times, and he died during one of the attempts to further expand his empire into China. But the peak of all of this was to be achieved during the otherwise short and politically unremarkable reign of Timur's grandson. This guy, Mirza Ulubeg. As I was saying in episode 2, Uluk Bey's rule was unimpressive from a political standpoint. He was given the reins of Samarkand by his father, who recaptured the city for him following the turmoil after Timur's death, and was appointed governor of Samarkand in 1409 at the age of 16, and in 1411 he is appointed the sovereign ruler of the whole Mavarnakhe, or Transoxania which is modern-day Uzbekistan, western Tajikistan, including the whole of the Fergana Valley, and some parts of modern-day Kazakhstan. It should be noted that after Timur's death, the capital was moved from Samarkand to Herat, which today, unfortunately, is in Afghanistan, which means it can't be easily visited. Politically, Uluk Bey was under the shadow of his father, for his whole life. As soon as his father died, the Game of Thrones got him killed less than two years later, and the only reason we still know any of this is because his nephew, Abdallah Mirza, placed his remains at Timur's feet in 1450 in the gur e Amir in Samarkand, alongside multiple chronicles which were then found by Soviet archaeologists 500 years later. gur e Amir is this place a collection of necropolises that survives to this day. A lot of the people buried here remain unknown to this day, but the hallways and the yard of the place are open for visitation. And as you can see, if you get the right camera angle and the right people in the frame, you're basically back to the 1400s with the atmosphere. I assure you, this is footage I have taken personally, and it's not cut from some artistic movie. You can tell it's my footage, because who else would focus so much on this fella? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so, while politically Uluk Bey was far from impressive, from a cultural, spiritual, and artistic perspective, he was the closest you'll get in this part of the world to a saint. So, as a teenage ruler, the first decisions that he makes are to be expand the university, build an even bigger madrasa in Registon, and begin the work for an astronomic observatory. Again, this is the early 1400s, so do keep in mind that madrasa meant something entirely different to what it means today. In many parts of the world, madrasas are associated with political extremism and radicalization. Uluk Bey's madrasas, however, were centers of higher learning and cutting-edge science. This observatory, finished in 1429, was the second or third biggest in the world at the time, but the most precise in the world. 
The telescope hadn't been invented yet, so Ulugbeg designed the observatory to increase the accuracy by increasing the length of the sextant. This so-called Fahri sextant had a radius of about 36 meters and the optical separability of 180 seconds of arc. The Fahri sextant was the largest instrument of the observatory in Samarkand, but it wasn't the only instrument. The purpose of the Fahri was to measure the transit altitudes of the stars. This observatory and the results produced by Ulugbeg with it was later on used as the starting point by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, 150 years later. In the little museum next to the observatory, we also find out that Uluk Bey was in fact in contact with contemporary scientists and later on, even hundreds of years later, modern scientists continued to cite his work. Between the 2nd century AD and the 1430s, nobody had managed to properly audit and update Claudius Ptolemy's catalogue of stars. At first, Uluk Bey wasn't even aware of Ptolemy's work, so he composed a star catalogue of his own with a different methodology, and his first edition had 1,018 stars, 11 fewer than Ptolemy's catalogue, but quite a few also different than the ones uh, published by Ptolemy 1,200 years prior. Realizing that others had worked on this before, Uluk Bey invites scholars from around the world, not just the Islamic world, to work on this, which resulted in a very complex catalogue of stars. Much later on, over 200 years after his death, this original catalogue of the Middle Ages is then edited by Thomas Hyde at Oxford in 1665, with a title in Arabic and one in Latin. Those were the times when British intellectuals spoke three or more languages, unlike today. Speaking of which, Huluk Beg spoke Arabic, Persian, Turkic, Mongolian and Chinese. Present-day intellectuals are convinced they're special for having learned a hundred words in Spanish. Anyway, in addition to star catalogues, Wuluk Bey managed to calculate the length of a year at 365 days, 6 hours, 10 minutes and 8 seconds. His error was just 58 seconds. Unhappy with the result, he did the work again and reached a result with an error of just 25 seconds, and that error was really only corrected less than 70 years ago, when atomic clocks became a thing. In school, you are taught uh, quite a bit about Nicolaus Copernicus, but his calculus in 1525 also relied on work from the Islamic world, although the wrong one, since Copernicus's estimation had an error of plus 30 seconds. But besides these geeky stuff, such as determining the Earth's axial tilt, Uluk Bey wrote accurate trigonometric tables for sine and tangent values correct to at least eight decimal places, which ended up being highly important for resilient constructions not just in Samarkand and Bukhara, but everywhere else in the civilized world too. And he proved that with the constructions that stood for centuries after his death, despite being in an area that has frequent earthquake, the kind of which created the latest tragedy at the border between Turkey and Syria. Those kinds of earthquakes are very common in both what is today Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Yeah, sure, they've undergone serious consolidation in modernity, but there are pictures taken at the turn of the previous century showing that the basic structures did survive without interventions for century, which tells me that Uluk Bey got competent people to work on this place as well as Bukhara, these two cities getting special attention from Uluk Bey throughout his rule. But as I said, all of this cultural and scientific development was taking place on the background of very serious political turmoil, which got even worse after the death of Uluk Bey's father and the fierce fighting for influence between the Timurids attracted the attention of the Uzbek nomadic tribes living to the north of the Aral Sea. The city of Samarkand found itself under siege four times in less than ten years. 1494, 1497, 1501, and 1505. The first three sieges were by other Timurid factions. The last one, that also proved successful, was by the Uzbeks, who had started the invasion of the Mawar Nahr in 1505. 
1501. So in other words, the Timurid factions fought each other for Samarkand and an external force won. And in many ways, this is where the modern history of Uzbekistan begins. The Uzbeks in early 16th century learned from the mistakes of the political project they had just conquered. So instead of trying to make a huge unitary empire, they established smaller states in a very loose confederation. But not before trying a unified version themselves, too. The short-lived Uzbek Khanat, or the Abul Khair Khanat, was short-lived for the reason discussed in episode 3. The Kazakhs started their war of independence, and that war lasted 30 years and drained the Uzbek Khanat of resources. The Kazakhs won, and so the remaining Uzbek Khanat now extended southwards, reorganized in smaller pieces. The most important ones were the Hanat of Bukhara and the Hanat of Hiva. The Hanat of Bukhara ended up lasting for almost 300 years, from 1500 to 1785. De facto, it ceased to be an independent state in 1740 when it got conquered by Iran, but de jure, the Hanat of Bukhara was abolished in 1785 when it was turned into the Emirate of Bukhara, thus changing the geopolitics from legitimacy via Genghis Khan to legitimacy via Islamic jurisprudence. In other words, the political legacy of Genghis Khan lasted for more than 500 years after his death, and we're quite a lot into this video and we still haven't got to the Russian problem. So keep this in mind as you hear Russian shills discussing about how Uzbekistan is part of Ruski Mir. If anything, some portions of southern Russia are part of Uzbek Mir. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> long story short, while politically these places lasted quite a bit, they couldn't stop the time. The development of maritime routes killed the main source of revenue and prosperity, the Silk Road itself. In addition to that, the Uzbeks' struggle with Iran also led to the cultural isolation of Central Asia from the rest of the Islamic world, thus interrupting the civilizational development that had started under Timur. By 1785, Bukhara, Samarkand and Hiva were a shell of their former selves. Samarkand had been abandoned in the 1720s and remained a ghost town for the rest of the 18th century or a marginal village within the Hanat of Bukhara. <laughs>
The change to the Emirate of Bukhara coincides with the arrival of the Russian problem. As mentioned in episode 3, the latter half of the 18th century saw the arrival of the Russian problem in Kazakhstan. Well, come the 19th century, the Russian problem gradually becomes generalized throughout Central Asia. Specifically for Uzbekistan, this period is marked by internal weakness. You see, it wasn't just the Russian problem, it was also the Iranian problem, which, although decreasing in importance, this aspect wasn't fully noticed by the local elites of the Emirates or Hanats. There were many reasons that attracted the Russians here. From the cotton potential, to the commercial potential, to looking for some Russian slaves that had disappeared from the trade routes, but also geopolitical power plays. If you remember, the entirety of the 19th century is known as the Great Game, in which the perfidious Albion and the Russian problem struggled for supremacy over Asia. The interest in the cotton potential of Uzbekistan was sparked in Russia as a result of the American Civil War, actually. You see, the main supplier of cotton to Russia was the United States. When the civil war broke out, the supply of cotton dried up and the Tsarist authorities were compelled by the industry to look for a new place to source cotton from. Imagine that. One of the reasons you can still get along in Russian today on the streets of the historical city of Samarkand is because of a conflict breaking out 12,000 kilometers away. And this was in the 19th century, long before the internet and mass communications. I'm dwelling on this because here, on the Freedom Alternative, we routinely insist that the more things change, the more they stay the same. This idea that global trade and one conflict here having repercussions on the other end of the world is somehow a new thing, it's an idea that, in addition to being wrong, it is also, unfortunately, once again making its rounds through circles whose study of history is limited to World War II and a few other carefully cherry-picked terminally online topics. So, by 1873, the entire territory of what is today Uzbekistan was either under direct control of Petrograd or was a quote-unquote protectorate. With that said, life in the former Hanates and Emirates hadn't changed much, except for the increased focus on cotton, which made the initial experience with Russia radically different than the one in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan or Kyrgyzstan. The Tsar was all too happy to leave the local life more or less autonomous as long as the cotton kept on flowing from here towards Russia. Also, unlike in Kazakhstan, the local elite was also kept in power. The Emir of Bukhara, for instance, continued to rule over domestic affairs and the Trans-Aral and the Trans-Caspian railways built by the Russian Empire more or less along the Silk Road was in fact good for business, at least at first. The city of Samarkand knows yet another revival, from an abandoned village in 1800 to a commercial hub by 1888 and the capital of the newly formed Samarkand Oblast of Russian Turkestan. Sure, some Russian settlements were built next to the established cities of Tashkent and Samarkand and then later on Hiva, but for the most part of the 19th century the Russians didn't mix with the indigenous population unless required to. This same period leads to the emergence of a new middle class and, overall, it wasn't that bad. However, with the building of the railways and the migration department uh, set up in Russia to encourage migration by Russians into Central Asia, things were going to change at the turn of the 20th century. Even so, with the exception of a few revolts here and there, put down easily by the Tsarist authorities, nothing was predicting what was going to happen. For starters, the Russians started to intrude more in the internal affairs of the Emirates. As a policy, Russia did not recognize or approve of the Wakf documents. Wakf is a concept in Islamic law and denotes an inalienable charitable endowment. A wakf can be applied to anything from small things, such as a canteen for poor people, to big things such as a madrasa or a university, a bridge or other goods of public use built by philanthropists, but it can also apply to capital goods such as factories or land. 
In the case of Uzbekistan, the latter was the issue. The local elite was part of various lineages deemed over time as sacred families, and they derived their income from various enterprises bestowed upon them via Wekfe documents. With the new overlords, Russia, not recognizing them, the incomes of families began to fall and with them the whole social arrangement. Just like in Kazakhstan, the local intelligentsia either developed its own or adhered to other pre-existent ideas of resistance to Russian rule, such as the pan-Turkish movement of Jadidism, a secular movement aimed at preserving indigenous Islamic Central Asia way of life from Russian encroachment. It was the region's major movement of political resistance at the turn of the 20th century, but one of the reasons it failed was that in addition to Russians, the old Uzbek Huns also opposed it, albeit for different reasons. The Jadidists were educated men who had traveled uh, to learn from Russia, but also from the modernizing movements in Istanbul, and believed that both society and religion need to be reformed and modernized. Except their idea of modernization didn't sit right either with Petrograd or with the old Huns. The 1905 revolution in Russia raised hopes that this can be achieved, but the democratic reforms promised gradually faded and Russia instead turned to even more authoritarianism. Because the more things change, the more they stay the same. After the Tsarist repression, most of the reformers went into exile, though some of them would come back as Soviet leaders less than 20 years later. But until we get to the Soviet period, we should note that the decree by the Tsar in 1916 to annul the immunity to conscription duty of the peoples of Central Asia sparked revolts here too, just like everywhere else in the region. With that said, the consequences were much milder here because, unlike Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, Russia hadn't disrupted the way of life here that much. The concern here was preservation of rights, or, if you want, the, pol the politics here was conservative rather than reactionary. Nevertheless, the troubles brought by the 1916 Central Asia revolts and then later on by the February and October revolutions in Russia presented a new opportunity for the Jadidists who quickly repeated the events in Tashkent by overthrowing the Tsarist administration of the Governor-General. It should be said that it was Russia that moved the capital from either Bukhara or Samarkand to Tashkent, where it still stays to this day. With that said, the Jadidist attempt uh, was deeply unpopular because what they wanted was a dual system with provisional government with direct Soviet power and with a complete exclusion of native Muslims from that power. This led to a split among the Jadidists and that's how the Basmachis emerged, whose goal was to revolt and resist Soviet rule. Many of them remained in an armed resistance way into the 1930s, in fact. However, most Jadidists remained with the communists, and the Bolshevik victory in the Russian Civil War drew large support of the population with promises of local autonomy and even some economic autonomy. I mean, it didn't cost Lenin anything to promise that, did it? So the last emir of Bukhara is overthrown in 1920 and replaced with the short-lived Bukharan People's Soviet Republic, which would then be merged under Uzbek SSR. While overthrowing the emir of Bukhara, those doing it were firmly convinced that they'd get a better protection of their rights under Moscow. Lenin had said so, right? Of course, most of that never ended up happening because Russia never keeps its word. In the present, one can visit the seat or the palace of the last emir of Bukhara. This place, the Sitorai Mohi Hossa Palace, finished in 1918 and named after the emir's wife, is a small microcosm of the world that was lost with the removal of the emir. By 1920, the emirs had in fact embraced modernity a lot more than the Bolsheviks for sure, but they had done so with much more wisdom too, given that violence as a main recourse to settle issues hadn't been a thing for over a century, until the Bolsheviks showed up, and the emir had opposed the Jadidists because of their ideas that were simply too radical. <laughs> 
Looking back, in hindsight, by 1920, it was already too late, and the position of the emirs would have made no difference. Nevertheless, the emir sided with the Basmachis, so the jihadists removed him. In the revolutionary fervor, the Russians also partially destroyed this place, the Ark of Buhara. This fortress survived the Mongols and the countless wars and aggressions of the second millennium, but it couldn't entirely survive the Russians. Later on, the Jadidists that helped establish communism here, such as Faizullah Ubaidulayevich Hojaev, the first, first secretary of the Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, ended up arrested and shot in the head in 1938. The famine of the early 1930s, uh, the direct result of Soviet policy, was blamed on Comrade Hojaev. Very convenient, as Stalin then replaced him with the Russian and commenced the Russification of Uzbekistan's entire political and economic life, an aggressive policy that lasted all the way till the late 1970s. And this is where things get really complicated. You see, there's basically nothing in between 1930 and 1954, a year after Stalin's death. What happened in Uzbekistan during the Stalinist period is more or less a state secret. And although I spent several days touring universities and centers of learning, not to mention all bookstores in Tashkent, Bukhara, and Samarkand, there's nothing written in great detail about the Stalinist period. It's as if it never happened. One young guy from Bukhara, seeing me annoyed in one of the bookstores and also wanting to practice his English, asked me what I was looking for. When I said that I want books about the history of Uzbekistan from any period between 1785 and 2016, he just burst into laughter. Sir, you're going to have to come back here a few years from now. Hopefully we will write them by that time, he said. As I was alluding to in episode 2, Uzbekistan is in the process of writing its own story. I'm sure some of that will also amount to revisionism, but in some aspects it may be the first time Uzbekistan even tells its story. I'm not sure I can convey this enough, but there really isn't much to be said about the Stalinist period, and not because nothing happened, but quite literally because the whole period has been erased. Although m much of the figures uh, purged in 1937 have been rehabilitated in 1966, the corresponding process of writing them back into the story hasn't happened. To this day, one can't exactly find out what went on between 1927 and 1953. And it doesn't get much better during Khrushchev and Brezhnev either, although for different reasons. You see... The experience of Stalinism taught the local elite something, namely that you can use the inherent corruption of Moscow against itself. So that's pretty much what happened after the death of Stalin and the wave of rehabilitations. Some Uzbek nationalists were rehabilitated under Khrushchev and more Uzbeks began to join the Communist Party and get positions in government. Yes, that also meant to accept Russification, at least in part. One had to be fluent in Russian in order to be allowed to hold a position in the party or in government. That policy was maintained from the Stalin era. In fact, some of the people purged in 1937 were not accused of Article 58 violations, like it was the case with many sent to the Gulag, but of various religious crimes. You see, burying a relative on the Muslim right was a crime. After Stalin, it was no longer a jailable offense, but being religious was a barring condition from obtaining a relevant position in society. Those who did not abandon their Uzbek lifestyles were not welcomed. With that said, the local elite found a workaround that should sound very familiar to those in Eastern Europe. Say, like Moscow or Brussels these days but then do the way you know it's better. So Uzbeks began regaining leading positions in society in post-Stalinism and then immediately re-established unofficial networks based on regional and clan loyalties. Uzbekistan was nominally a Soviet republic, but in practice resumed working as a confederation of Hanats, essentially. The epitome of this way of functioning was this man, Sharaf Rashidov first secretary of the Communist Party of Uzbekistan from 1959 to 1983. 
his tenure almost entirely overlaps with the tenure of Brezhnev and the era of stagnation. Mr. Rashidov remains notable in a negative way in the Uzbek consciousness not because he brought numerous relatives and associates from his native Zizakh into government and party leadership positions. That much is to be expected. It's how things have been done here since times immemorial and, of course, not even the Soviet Union could change that for too long. He remains notable in a negative way because he did not share in accordance with the local custom. The individuals he brought into leadership treated their positions as personal fiefdoms for personal enrichment without any consideration to the wider community. With that said, he remains a mixed bag since he also initiated efforts to make Uzbekistan less subservient to Moscow, an aspect still appreciated to this day. After the death of Brezhnev in 1982 and the death of Mr. Rashidov in 1983, a corruption scandal rocked the boat here as it surfaced that Mr. Rashidov's success was based on bribery. I'm sure everyone is surprised to learn this. <laughs> Basically, what this guy did was simple. He quite literally bought most of the high officials in the Kremlin and remained a loyal ally of Leonid Brezhnev and, in return, Moscow would not notice that Uzbekistan wasn't meeting the cotton quotas and really wasn't following the Soviet policy pretty much at all. Now, probably nobody would have found out about this if not for the pesky thing called the Soviet-Afghan War. Since Uzbekistan was on the border with Afghanistan, keeping things in order here was quite important for the Soviet war effort. And in 1983, everyone in the Kremlin found out that everything was far from being in order. But in 1983, the Kremlin was embroiled in its own problems. If you remember, the Kremlin burned through four presidents between 1982 and 1985, so it took another three years until 86, during Gorbachev, when the matter reached trial. By that time, however, the policies of openness have started to come into effect, so the massive purge of the Uzbek leadership, the corruption trials and the spreading of the word throughout the USSR that corruption and Uzbekistan are pretty much synonymous, didn't exactly have the intended effect. Uzbek resentment and nationalism in fact increased and, under the Glasnost policy, now it could also be openly expressed and the local intelligentsia wasted no time in articulating just that. Suddenly, the problem got bigger. It wasn't just the corruption, but it was also strong dissatisfaction with the emphasis on cotton, the environmental disasters in the country, almost all as a result of Moscow's policy, and perhaps most important, Moscow's relentless attempts to uproot Islamic tradition. The unity movement, or Birlik, lost the argument as the local communists were able to reassert their authority. But the party lost the legitimacy gradually throughout the 1980s, especially because of the Soviet-Afghan war. Admittedly, this was also helped by the spread of radical anti-Soviet Islamic propaganda by both the MI6 and the CIA during the same Soviet-Afghan war. The Western intelligence services had calculated, correctly as it turns out, which is by the way rare, that the Uzbeks would have very legitimate reasons to be upset already with Moscow, so they were already been primed for grievance. In the face of all of this mess, Gorbachev tones it down with the purges, eventually ends the Afghan war, and in 1989, the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Uzbek SSR changed again in the person of this guy, Islam Abduganievich Karimov. Officially, he was appointed after his predecessor, short-lived Rafik Nishonov, failed to quell inter-ethnic clashes and instability in the Fergana region. In reality, however, the reason was simple. Moscow wanted to tone down the political mess brought by the Afghan war, the purges, the corruption scandals, and Islam Karimov from Samarkand was a good choice. He hadn't been involved in the purges, was not a member of the local party elite, and was known as a good Muslim. Something which, until that moment, was in fact a barring condition. 
He would then go on to rule like an absolutist tyrant that would enact the harshest restrictions on Muslim life in the entire history of Uzbekistan, but nobody knew that in June 1989 when the Politburo approved him. In fact, the Politburo didn't even live long enough to see it happening as the USSR itself ceased to exist while Islam Karimov's regime was going to survive all the way till 2016 and with the reverberations of his demented policies being noticeable all the way till present day. But that's a story for the next two episodes. That's the shortest version of the history of Uzbekistan leading up to Islam Karimov, whose rule we'll go through in the next episode. What's important to keep in mind is that Uzbekistan is significantly different from all of its neighbors, not just because of its politics, past or present, but because unlike its neighbors, it is the hair of a very long history of a local civilization and of documented greatness in a way that Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan or Kyrgyzstan simply aren't. There is a way of life and a way of doing things here that could not be broken by either 70 years of Soviet rule or almost 30 years under Islam Karimov. And I don't refer here just to religion, although that is part of it, but even more generally. The way Uzbeks think about power and about the environment, about how they relate both to one another and to foreigners or even how they think about corruption. In the next episode, I have a few stories about corruption under Islam Karimov, told to me by several business owners. It's not that Uzbeks are in principle against corruption, but on a gut level, they are able to detect the kind of corruption that is systemic and corrosive and accurately distinguish it from general corruption that is, after all, part of human nature. And with that, I will stop here for the time being with the story of Uzbekistan. Thank you all for watching, thank you for your continuous and generous support, especially to those who made this tour possible. Don't forget to subscribe, visit our website, and if you like what we do, consider making the next series possible. Details in the description box. Do svidanja i uvidimsia na alternative svobode.